One of the things that I love about the Lord is that He loves to go to the places where He can find those who have been rejected, those who have been hurt and abandoned. He loves to go to places that no one else is willing to go. In fact, in Mark chapter 2 verse 15 to 17, the Bible says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus makes it his business to go and find himself in situations where there are those who have been forgotten, those who have been denied, shunned away and pushed to the side. God loves to connect to the people who others consider to be outcasts. And I wonder how many people are listening right now and because of some difficulty in your life, you feel disconnected, you feel isolated. Perhaps you can manage to smile, but you are crying within. Well, allow me to encourage you with the word of God. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 25 says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. I would also like to remind you that Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. And finally, Psalm 28 verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I will praise him. And so, dear listener, let me remind you, in Jesus Christ you are not alone. Regardless of what you are facing, regardless of what stands before you, God has not forgotten about you. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercies, which are new every morning. I pray that you would strengthen our hearts today. May the Holy Spirit strengthen our faith today. May he remind us that when the troubles of life begin to overwhelm us, we have a friend in Jesus. When our problems are many, and we need relief when we need peace. I pray that the Holy Spirit would remind us that the Word of God says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We serve a living God who is more than able to carry our burdens. There is nothing that is too difficult for our God. He can still move mountains. He can still cause every wall that is in your life to fall. And for that we are grateful. We have reason to rejoice. 
I pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength to rise up each and every day and fight against the struggles that weigh us down. You are the God of the impossible, and there is nothing too big for you to handle, no problem too great or challenge too difficult for you to overcome. And so it is because of you, Lord Jesus, that we can stand. It's because of you that we have the victory. Father, with each and everyone listening today, we bring before you our burdens and our troubles. Help us not to fear, but to trust you. Help us not to be discouraged, but to have joy in you. Help us not to take your goodness and your kindness for granted. I declare that my faith is in your ability to fulfill all of your promises. You will fight for us, Lord, as you have said in your word. We have nothing to fear because you are with us. Though many difficulties may present themselves to us in our lives, we will not be crushed, we will not be destroyed, but we will be able to stand in faith looking unto Jesus, my Saviour, my help and my stronghold in the day of trouble. We pray and declare that the favour of the Lord will rest upon our lives. The favour of the Lord will establish the work of our hands. May the favour and blessing of the Lord rest upon each and everyone who is listening, upon their families and in their lives. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We give you all the glory and all the praise. Lord Jesus, help us to keep your word. Help me to keep your word hidden in the chambers of my heart. I pray that I would not just know your word, but I might walk in your word. Help me to keep your precepts diligently so that all my ways are directed by you. Help me to keep your statutes. May your word convict my heart. I pray that I would be someone who truly lives in obedience to your word. May your word challenge me so that I would not live a life of hypocrisy where I can claim to be a Christian, but I am not a doer of the word. Instead, Father, I pray that I may live and keep your word with my whole heart. Open my spiritual eyes so that I may see all of the wonderful revelations and promises that are in your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would push me to meditate on God's Word. Help me to make it a practice, to make it a routine to read the Bible and spend quality time in the Word. I know that there is a need in my life to get to know the Word of God because it will change me, it will build my character, and it will mold me into a vessel that the Lord can use. It will cut through every evil, carnal, and selfish thought within me. And the Word of God can even challenge my very attitude and perspective. Father, the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 25 to 29, My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts so shall I meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. Father, I pray that I would be revived by your word. May I be strengthened by your word. May the Holy Spirit help me to not just meditate on your word, but to understand the word of God and become a student of the word. I pray that you would remove me from living a carnal life. Direct me to the way that leads to eternity and into your arms. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your word is living, Almighty God, meaning it has life. It brings life, and it is life to the believer. I pray that your word would act just like fire and refine me of all my impurities. May you burn away the sin, the cycles of sin and addiction, Lord. Just like a hammer, I pray that your word would destroy any evil stronghold in my life. And I pray that it would build and strengthen a godly character in me. May your word act just like a mirror so that it will expose my blemishes against the true likeness of Christ. And just like a lamp and a light that guides us in the darkness, may your word give me direction and reveal purpose in my life. Like food, may your word provide nourishment because your word says man cannot live by bread alone but by every word that comes from God. May your holy word, your word which has withstood the test of time, may it cleanse and wash me. May it renew my mindset and build my faith. Psalm 119 verse 168 to 172 reads, I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. I bless your name, and I praise you, King Jesus. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. At this moment in time, I want to encourage you to pray for your family. In Job chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible reads, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Now it's because of this that we are then told, in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8, to stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I believe that the devil is after the home. He wants to destroy the family, 
and especially the Christian family. The devil does not want godly homes, homes that are unified by the love of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want homes whereby husbands love their wives as Christ loves the church. He does not want homes whereby wives respect and honour their husbands. And he certainly doesn't want homes where children are obedient to parents. And so with this said, we need to look to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 16 verse 31, the Bible states, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. That's what we should all be praying for. Not just that we might be saved as individuals, but our households. We should be praying and saying, Lord, remember my family. Remember my children. Only Jesus Christ can save us. And so it's to him that we should submit and surrender. The word household is defined as those who dwell under the same roof and compose a family. There should be togetherness in a household. That's why in Acts 16 verse 31, the Bible said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. In other words, you and your family will be saved when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, Joshua made a declaration and said, As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua basically said, Me and my family have made a decision to serve the Lord. And so today, what will your household stand for? Who will your family stand to serve? I encourage you to begin to pray and commit your family into the hands of God. Often I find that my personal prayer points are that my home would have the presence of God dwelling in it always. My prayer is that this house would have a peaceful spirit in it and there would be unity among all who reside here. My prayer is that this house would hold a sweet spirit of forgiveness in Jesus' name. May it have the word of God as its ruling authority. And in this house, may the name of Jesus Christ be above every other name. And so, as you listen, I encourage you to pray over your family. Pray over your home. May our homes be places where the love of God resides, where the presence of the Lord resides. May the walls in our homes be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, so that no evil, no plague, no pestilence will befall us. And most importantly, may our homes be places where the name of Jesus Christ is honoured and feared above all else. Dear Lord, in agreement with everyone listening right now, we pray for our families. We pray for our children. We pray for our homes and we pray for our marriages. Cover us, King Jesus. Fight for us, Lord. Intervene in all of our affairs. May the Holy Spirit move into our homes and bring about a revival a change in our hearts. Our prayer, Lord, is that you would make yourself known to us. Let us see your hand working in our families. Wherever there is a disturbance, bring peace, Lord Jesus. Where there is dysfunction, bring order. Your word in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Help us, Lord, to put these things away. 
Help us to be a family that is united to obey your word. Should there be any anger festering in our homes? Should there be any unforgiveness, Father, let your living waters flow over our lives and bring a sweet spirit of unity and togetherness. Open the heart of every family member, every father, every mother, every son and daughter. Open our hearts and revive us. Quicken our spirits so that we may long and chase after you as a family. Flood our hearts with love, the pure love of God. We pray, Lord, that no member in our families would be lukewarm, but rather may we as individuals and as a collective unit be on fire for you, Lord. Convict our hearts and draw us to repentance. Every child who is acting in rebellion, we pray that you would touch their hearts and crush any spirit that is not from you, Lord. We pray for every husband. May they be obedient to your word and love their wives as Christ loves the church. We pray for every wife who is listening. May they respect and honor their husband as instructed by the word of God. In agreement with everyone listening, we pray and declare that in this home we will serve the Lord. We rebuke every idol that attempts to gain our affection or our attention over you, King Jesus. There is only one Lord and ruler in this home, and his name is Jesus Christ. Help us as a family not to be indoctrinated by the many teachings of this world. Help us not to be influenced by the teachings of this world, but rather may we hold on to the biblical definition of what a godly family is. Help us to hold on to your word, Lord. Teach us to meditate and dwell on your word as a family. Your word in Psalm 133 verse 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's only by your grace that we can live in unity. We can only live and walk in agreement because of you, Father. And so I pray that you would bring unity in our families, bring unity and love in our households. May the atmosphere in our homes be pleasing to you, let there be no foul spirits, no foul words or actions that chase your presence away. But instead, Lord, help us to be diligent in fostering an atmosphere of praise and worship each and every day. Help us to be diligent in creating an atmosphere of thanksgiving each and every day. Be blessed and glorified, Lord. Thank you for hearing our hearts cry. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, words fail to express just how grateful we are for your goodness, for your love, and your mercy. Master, your word tells us that you've chosen us. You have called us to come out from the world and be separate. You have called us to live lives that honor you, lives that serve you and please you. So, Father, our prayer today is that you would help us. Give us the grace and the strength so that we would not be conformed to this world, so that we would not be attached to the superficial values and the customs of this world. But help us, Lord, to be transformed. Help us to be changed and renewed in our minds. God, we thank you for making us your own. We hold on to your word in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, where it says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, 
a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Thank you, God, for being a father to the fatherless. Thank you for being our load bearer. God, if it had not been for you, where would we be? We praise you, God, because even in your majesty and your righteousness, you still care for us. You still forgive us time after time, even though we fall time and time again. God, we thank you for such mercy. And Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would put the understanding in our hearts that we can never be victorious in this life if we are not in Christ. Matthew 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. Lord, right now we declare that you alone are our one and only master. You are our leader. Indeed, no one can serve two masters at once. Light and darkness do not mix. And so, Father, we choose to stand and follow the light of Christ. We commit to you, Lord Jesus, and our honest request is that the Holy Spirit would work within our hearts, that he would work within our minds, so that we will have the kind of commitment that says, not my will, Lord, but your will is all important. Truly, Father, it's not about my wants. It's not about my feelings, but it's all about you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, give us the kind of heart that's so committed to the Lord that it's willing to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Help us to carry our cross, Lord Jesus. Your word in Matthew 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. In you, Father, I will be satisfied. In you, King Jesus, I will be nourished by your goodness. I glorify your name, Lord Jesus. Be blessed, be glorified. Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and we give you thanks. Amen and Amen. The Lord is merciful. He is merciful to those who repent. No one is perfect. We all fall short. But here's the sign that you're growing as a Christian. When you struggle with sin, when you get to a point where you find no pleasure in sin, this is a clear sign that your faith is alive. Your heart is not hardened. Because if it were, if you were spiritually dead, you would have no problem sinning. So I encourage you to rely on the grace of God. Rely on the strength of the Lord to overcome sin. And the first step to overcoming sin is always repentance. For every believer, there are two emotions that we need to guard our hearts from. And these two destructive emotions are bitterness and anger. And if left to fester and develop in the heart, these two emotions can cause division among believers. These are the emotions that can break relationships and can seriously hinder a person's faith. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. A different translation says, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Notice that this verse doesn't even warn us to be cautious of bitterness itself. It pleads with us to be cautious of the root 
of this bitterness. Paul was careful and intentional in his use of this analogy. Let's consider the life of a plant. Usually, we can't see a seed after it's been put into the ground, nor can we see its roots, but we do see the fruit and we do see the flowers once they pierce the earth and come above ground. Much like bitterness, the root of a plant is not visible to the naked eye. We may only be aware that a seed was planted when we see the fruit. Paul knew that bitterness was so destructive that it needed to be uprooted as soon as the seed germinated. He didn't warn the Hebrews to dispose of the fruit of bitterness. Oh no. He knew that when you see the fruit of bitterness, oh, it's much too late then. You see, if we wait for bitterness to be visible above ground, we risk being a threat to others. This is why the Bible says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. This means that before bitterness even gets to the surface, we should eradicate it. Now, here's what the Bible says about anger. James 1, verses 19 through 20. Understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear, be a careful, thoughtful listener, slow to speak, a speaker of carefully chosen words, and slow to anger, patient, reflective, forgiving. For the resentful, deep-seated anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God, that standard of behavior which he requires from us. The Bible doesn't tell us not to be angry. It tells us not to sin by letting anger control you. This is because anger can be like a wildfire. It leaves behind destruction and ruin. Anger and bitterness are strong emotions, and they're emotions that we, as children of God, should be guarded against. We need to pray for the Lord to purge our hearts. Only God can make us pure. Only through the power of the Holy Ghost can we have true self-control. Now with all this in mind, let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, please help us to control our emotions. Lord, let us be slow to anger And help us to become more and more like you, so that we can be forgiving, so that we can show others mercy, so that we can extend grace to others. God, your word in Colossians 3, verse 13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Give us hearts that are quick to forgive, Lord. Give us hearts that make allowance for each other's faults. Father, give us hearts that don't hold on to offense, but rather as much as it depends on us, may we live in peace with all. Dear Lord, we're asking you to remove any bitterness from our hearts. Free us from all feelings of resentment. And King Jesus, heal us from any pain. Heal us from any circumstances that can result in us becoming bitter. Lord, there are people listening that need to be healed from the pain of rejection. And so we ask you to touch them, Father. There are those who have been betrayed and abandoned. May you heal their hearts so that they'll know you as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Father, for every lonely heart, for every person that has been abandoned or felt isolated, Please melt away any anger that's in their hearts. Melt away every root of bitterness and prevent it from growing. Master, instead, give us hearts that burn with the love of God. Hearts that seek to serve all for your glory. Hearts that are not only willing to show mercy, but that are able to show mercy and forgive all of those who have wronged us. Give us the grace to move on. Father, give us the grace to let go of the wounds of the past. Give us the strength to forgive 
and to let go of everyone who's ever hurt us or persecuted us. God, help us to be obedient to your word, as it says in Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Lord Jesus, give us hearts that are willing to obey you, hearts that strive to walk in obedience to your will and to your ways. God, let us never be inclined to do things our own way, but rather, may we seek first wisdom and counsel from you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us a teachable spirit. Give us a humble spirit, a spirit that is patient and not self-serving. Lord, teach us to love the way you loved, to show compassion to all, just like you did. Lord Jesus, help us to show mercy to all who have wronged us. Father, I thank you for hearing this prayer. I thank you for your love, and I thank you for your mercy. God, be glorified both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord Jesus, we praise your name. You are holy. You are just and pure. Your word in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 to 10 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us. Forgive us for all that we have done wrong. Forgive us for every evil thought. Forgive us for every wicked action. Lord Jesus, I repent. I ask that you would have mercy on my soul. Help us to do what we ought to do. Help us to be obedient to your commands and your word. Give us the grace to overcome sin. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would empower us to overcome sin. Cover us and fill us, Holy Ghost, so that sin would have no hold over us. Should we be tempted, give us the strength to resist. Should we be tempted, remind us that Jesus Christ offers so much more joy and satisfaction. Should we be tempted by sin, Holy Spirit, help us to see what sin really is. It's disobedience. It's rebellion from God. It's separation from Christ. Give us wisdom during those moments of temptation. Remind us, Holy Ghost, that the devil is a liar. He offers sin in an attractive form, but in reality, it is all an illusion that comes with a heavy price. Turn our lives around, King Jesus. I do not want to be caught in the same cycles of sin. I don't want to be a habitual sinner, Lord Jesus. I want to practice holiness I want to practice righteousness. Whatever may displease you, whatever doesn't exalt you, remove it from our lives. Whatever characteristic or behaviors that displease you, Lord, remove them. Work in us, King Jesus. Our lives belong to you and our hearts are yours. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Lord, I humble myself before you. 
I am not worthy to be in your presence, but I thank you for the mercy and grace you have afforded me. Father, your word tells me that if I pray and seek your face, and if I turn from my wicked ways, then you will hear me. I thank you for such a promise. Holy Spirit, work within me so that I may turn from my carnal ways and follow Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Every now and again, it's good to look back. And when I say look back, I'm not talking about admiring your old sinful ways. I'm not talking about reminiscing about the ungodly things you used to do. No, I'm encouraging you to remember. Remember how far God has taken you from. Remember how many battles you came through when you know good and well that it wasn't by your strength. Remember how the Lord has loved you and comforted you even when your friends betrayed you. Look back and remember how God's hand was over your life. You know that things should have fallen apart for you, but they didn't. Yes, every now and again, all of us ought to take a moment and remember. Remember all that God has done. Because it's easy to forget what God has done for us, especially when we're facing challenging times, especially when we come preoccupied with our daily routines. But do you know why it's so important to look back? It's important because you will begin to see how faithful our God has been time after time. You'll begin to see how God has watched over you and opened doors for you time after time. When we sit and reflect on the significant events that we've been through and those moments in our lives that we don't easily forget, we can recognize how God has been with us every step of the way. This is emphasized in Psalm 77, verse 11 to 12, where the Bible reads, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. This verse reminds us that God's work in the past, it's worthy of our reflection and our meditation. By focusing on God's faithfulness in the past, we can actually gain confidence in his promises for the future. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8 verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Secondly, remembering the past helps us to be grateful for what we have. When we look back and see how God has provided for us, how he's protected us, guided us, then we can develop a heart of gratitude. And God certainly loves a thankful heart. When we're filled with thanksgiving and gratitude, it actually helps us to focus on God's blessings rather than on our difficulties. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Note how Paul said, with thanksgiving, meaning it's an essential component if we want our request to be heard by God. By being thankful, we develop a deeper relationship with God, recognizing Him as the source of our blessings. A Puritan preacher by the name of Thomas Watson once said, Remembering the mercies of God breeds gratitude in our hearts. In addition to this, remembering our past helps us to share our testimony with other people. Our personal testimonies, they are powerful tools for evangelism and they can be used to inspire others to seek God. As we reflect on what God has done in our lives, 
we can share our experiences with others, showing them how God has transformed us and guided us through our life's journey. In conclusion, I'd like to quote the words of a Christian theologian by the name of J.I. Packer, and this is what he said. The past is a source of knowledge, and the future is a source of hope. Love of the past implies faith in the future. God, help us to see your hand in every situation. I look at your word, O God, and I can see that you have been faithful to those who believe in you, and you've done it time and time again. Your word in Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31, it says he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Father, I declare your word which tells me that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That means that you, King Jesus, have placed within me the strength to overcome adversity, the strength to overcome the devil. For that, Lord, I rejoice And God, I thank you. I thank you for giving us, your children, the power to walk in victory, the power to defeat sin. It all comes from you. So we bow down today. We humble ourselves and surrender to you, O God. We rely only on you, for you're the God who liberates. You're the God who redeems and who makes people whole again. God, I thank you for such love and mercy. Thank you for your kindness, because in your mercy, you have picked us up each time that we have fallen. You give us grace upon grace. We stand on your word, dear God, that says in Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, open our eyes. Help us to see that you are in charge. You're in control. And if you have allowed us to face some kind of difficulty or some kind of challenge, then there is a reason and a purpose to it. Change our perspective, dear Lord. Help us not to always seek to understand, but Lord, help us to trust you more and more. Forgive us for being so focused on wanting to know what your plans are instead of simply trusting and believing that you know us best. Change our perspective, dear God. When life presents us with storms, give us strong faith that says, Lord, If it is your will that I should face this storm, then strengthen me to overcome for your glory. Psalm 145, verses 8 through 11 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. Note these attributes of God. God is gracious. God is full of compassion. God is slow to anger. And God is great in mercy. 1 Chronicles 29.11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth. Yours is the dominion and kingdom, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. God, your ways are higher than our ways. Your ways are greater. Your word in Psalm 25 
verses 8 through 10. It says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. God, you are indeed upright and you are good. Your ways are filled with compassion. They're filled with mercy and steadfast love. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving your life for me. You gave your life for me so that I would not perish. So for your goodness, I say thank you. For being good to me, I say thank you, God. You've been good to me when you really could have condemned me. You could have cast me away because of my sins. You could have turned me away from your kingdom because of my sins. But instead, Lord Jesus, your word tells me that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You, Lord Jesus, are so good to me that I am at a loss for words. I know that I can't repay you. All I can do is simply thank you and praise you. Father, we bless your precious name. My King, we thank you for hearing this prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we begin the message and prayer for today, I would like to encourage you to find something in God's Word that you can meditate on throughout your day. Find a verse, find a chapter, find something in God's Word and meditate on it. Now let's look at Psalm 107 verse 1 to 9 and the Bible reads, O oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. O oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Now I would like to highlight verse 6. The Bible says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. As you listen to this prayer, I encourage you to remember this verse. When the people of God cried out to him, while they were in their trouble, he delivered them. He is a God who rescues. He's a God who's a bridge over troubled water. He is a God who moves mountains. And he is a God who has promised never to leave us or forsake us. As humans, we love heroes. And as Christians, we all certainly have biblical characters that we admire and look up to when it comes to their journey in faith. But as we think of some of these characters as giants of faith, we have to remember that all of the glory, all of the praise, and all of the honor should really go to the Lord. There's only one hero in the Bible, and that's Jesus Christ. The Bible is God's story, and no one else's. Yes, others were used by him, but no one else should be glorified but the Lord. So let's talk about David. 
the small shepherd boy became a giant slayer. But the truth is, David did not achieve the victory over Goliath, but God gave him the victory. The truth is that God directed the stone, and he put enough power behind that stone so that it was powerful enough to take Goliath out. The victory was God's, not David's. So who's the real hero of the story? Let's take a look at Gideon. That mighty man of valor defeated a Midianite army of thousands with only 300 men. Did Gideon achieve the victory? No. Gideon didn't even want to go. Gideon cowered in a cave and commanded that God give him signs in order to prove that he would help him. And in the end, Gideon was victorious. But it wasn't because he fought so skillfully. It was not because he was a brilliant general. But it was all because the Lord's hand was over him and over the 300 men in the army that he fought with. Now, let me ask you, do you remember Joshua? Do you remember how God gave him and the Israelites the victory over the massive city of Jericho? And all they had to do was march around and shout. They didn't lift a finger. Is that victory Joshua's? (laughs) No, that victory belongs to God. In all these cases, we can admire how God worked through David, but we should never praise David. We have to praise the Lord. We can admire how God used Gideon, but we should never praise Gideon. We ought to praise the Lord. So you see, there are great men and women of faith in the Bible, but we have to remember that these people did not have power. God had the power. These people had no authority. God was the one, and he is the one, who has all authority. These people didn't do anything except say yes to God's call. In fact, most of them had to be dragged into following God's call, and they went kicking and screaming. Think of Jonah running away. Think of Moses. Moses made so many excuses not to answer God's call to take on Pharaoh. Now, we must not fall into the trap of glorifying the vessel over the one who made the vessel. We must never glorify the one who was used, but rather the one who did the using. God is the giver of victory. God is the giver of life. And God is the giver of all good things. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so with all these things in mind, let us go to the one who deserves all the glory. Father, only you deserve to be praised. Only you hold the power. And only you are able to accomplish mighty things. Who else but you, Master? can be worshiped and glorified. There is none but you, King Jesus. Dear God, your word in Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Lord, rid us of every idol. Father, open our eyes so that we can recognize and discern anything and everything that tries to place itself above you in our lives. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us because at times we can so easily become consumed. 
We become consumed by our problems when something's going wrong. It can consume our thoughts and emotions. But Lord, I pray that you teach us to focus on you and not our problems. Lord, teach us to run and praise you instead of focusing on our circumstances. May we be a people who magnify you and no one else and nothing else. Lord, when a problem comes into our lives, help us to see that the enemy wants to use that to distract us. And so we cannot be so focused on that thing. We should not be found speaking continually on that thing because that then magnifies the problem. But Lord, may we be a people who are devoted to focusing on and magnifying the precious name of Jesus Christ. Psalm 72, verses 17 through 19. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So Lord, we desire the name of Jesus Christ to be uplifted in our lives. May the name of Jesus Christ be magnified in our homes. Lord, let our lips and our hearts only sing praises to you, King Jesus. And Father, I pray that our hearts would not be so focused on seeking signs and wonders or miracles, but rather let it be our desire that you would be lifted up high and glorified in all that we do. If we should experience victory, Lord, we praise you. If we should experience trouble and hardship, Father, we still give you the praise. Regardless of what our external circumstances may be, I pray that our internal posture is always going to be one of praise and one that seeks to bask in your presence, Lord. Father, we pray and declare your word that says in Psalm 19, verse 14, May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You're a God who brings peace beyond all human understanding. You're a God who brings joy unspeakable. You're a God who brings restoration and healing. And Father, we cannot get by in this life without you. There's no way we can survive the storms of life without you. So, Lord, we seek to dwell in your presence forever. We praise you, dear Lord. For you are magnificent, you are merciful and just, you are the righteous God, you are the true and holy one. And I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, we thank you for hearing this prayer, because it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and we give you all the glory. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way, they found no city to dwell in, Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. O oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. 
For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness.